I would like to um, welcome everybody to this session. Um, we're discussing supporting our students, um, especially supporting our students here at South Point High School with their well being and mental health. And um, I have three mental health specialists who are here with me today. My name is Mary Roosh, and I'm an educator here at South Point. And we wanted to talk through um, some questions and some answers that might help both um, parents and teachers in supporting students during the pandemic and um, this really difficult time. So at South Point, we understand that our students might be undergoing an extreme amount of stress due to the COVID pandemic and the changes to our school schedule. And our mission at South Point is to support students' academics in their lives through a healthy and nurturing environment. We want to be proactive in supporting our families. And so that's why we're here today to discuss mental health. And this is an opportunity to discuss uh, behaviors parents and teachers can look for if they are concerned about their students' mental well being. We also want to share some ways we can support our students to create healthy habits. So I'd like to take a moment and um, go to Ashley Baxter first, just let you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Baxter, and I am the school psychologist at South Point. And Kathy Coates. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Coates, and I am the uh, school-based therapist with Catawba Community Mental Health Center for South Point High School. And Kayla. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Pengelski. I am the Rock Hill School District Mental Health Counselor at South Point High School. Okay, and I just really would like to thank all three of you for joining in today and for, um, for sharing your expertise. And so I'll start with the first question. And it is, what are some signs that a student may be going through some challenges or stress that might be more than what is typical? And Kayla, could I start with you? So when we, yeah, absolutely. So, um, um, this is a really good question, um, and there are a lot of signs that can be noticed um, if we really just pay attention to our students. Um, we see a lot of, we've seen a lot of changes this year, um, and a lot of those changes have been thrown directly onto our students. Um, and so I'm going to start with one of, um, a couple of the biggest signs when it comes to academics that you may notice with your students um, that, may, that may warrant additional questioning. Um, we see a lot of avoidance behaviors with our students um, between juggling both virtual learning and face-to-face -face learning. It has been really hard for some of our students to maintain in that setting. Um, so what we're seeing is students who are either not showing up to in-person um, learning or they're not showing up to virtual learning. Um, and we usually call that avoidance. Um, they are avoiding their assignments. They are avoiding um, their teachers, and they may even be avoiding you and their friends. Um, this can lead to a lot of discouragement um, if they see that they are missing assignments. And so rather than um, being motivated to continue with their assignments, they just find themselves um, kind of what we call the hole of discouragement. And it's really hard for them to kind of dig themselves out of it. We may see um, some acting out behaviors, um, really behaviors that may not be warranted or may be triggered by anything that you can identify. Uh, we see a lot of isolation and alienation. Um, the, the forced isolation that we're seeing with our students who aren't able to engage with their friends um, kind of as that natural coping skill that's been taking away from them has really been um, increasing the amount of stress that we're seeing. Um, we may see some tearfulness, um, a lot of irritability and fatigue um, whether your student may be sleeping more or sleeping less, um, or even if they're getting a great night's sleep, but they just seem restless and tired, could be a sign of increased stress or anxiety. Um, they may have a really hard time making simple decisions. Um, poor decisions making skills is something that we see. Um, they kind of lose that self-confidence um, and that kind of self-awareness. We also start to see some poor concentration an inability to focus on tasks, especially school assignments that may be a little triggering for them. And finally, we may just start seeing some increased feelings of depression as well. Um, if you notice your child um, giving away any of their belongings or losing interest in activities that they 
were once really interested in, that is a red flag um, that, war that again, warrants your attention. Um, very, very important things that we definitely do not, do not want to ignore. And we don't want to just choke it up to, oh, it's just a hard time of year. Um, so our, some of our students are really, really struggling right now. Um, so anything that you feel is abnormal for your child, um, I, would I would consider that a red flag. Thank you so much for that. And I wanted to move to Kathy with our next question. So if a parent or even um, a teacher may notice some of these um, signs of anxiety and stress, how can a, a parent or even teachers support their child if they notice anxiety or stress? Um, once again, a, a wonderful question as well. My, I deal with a lot of students that has anxiety or the ADHD as well as other uh, mental health issues. One of the ways that as a parent myself, first and foremost, that you can support your child and or student is that if don't badger them, do not come in with a lot of you know, questions like what's going on or whatever. I tend to uh, recommend that you ask the student about their day. If you're the parent, how was your day? If your child responds back, it was fine. And then you come back with another response like what was fine about it? And they don't want to speak at that time. Allow them a moment of, to just relax, you know, revisit the situation when you feel like your, your child is more relaxed and comfortable uh, feels a little bit safe, you know. If you come in uh, reacting to your child and they're already up here at this level with their anxiety and you come in at this level, you're gonna make them go back up to that level. So now you have two people, the child and the parent with high anxiety and you're not gonna get anywhere with that. So just allow a moment for the, the child to kind of gather their thoughts, feel more comfortable, relax, and then revisit the situation. Uh, as a parent, you know, I would recommend that. Um, as a teacher, there's often some signs that you can see that the, the child is not engaging, the student is not engaging. Uh, they're, they're not paying attention. Um, they're not receptive to hearing what you're saying. They're maybe looking down in a dead space, you know, they're probably filling around with something else maybe have on one of their ear parts, you know. These are certainly ways that they're coping if they're doing that. Uh, do not be so quick to, um, to point out their wrongdoings, you know, in front of people. Uh, that's gonna heighten their anxiety. Um, I recommend allowing some of the students to have a little bit of a, bit of a break period, you know. You have to remember that they're going from one class to another. They're dealing with a lot with this COVID-19. They're already feeling overwhelmed and exhausted and frustrated with everything uh, that the nation is going through. So when you notice that the student is, is, is a little bit uh, in stress mode or, or having a little bit of anxiety, you know, maybe uh, bring the, the student up to your desk with that distance between them and see if they just need a little bit of a breather a little bit of a break to walk out of the classroom for a brief moment and just gather their thoughts, you know, uh, and then allow them to, to enter back in. I do find that when I am speaking with most of my students, that is one of the things that they kind of point out um, in, in sessions with me. If, if teachers can kind of really put themselves in their place and just, uh, and not be so critical about what's going on because you never know what's going on with the student at that time. So just giving them a little bit of a breather sometimes um, as far as in the classroom setting and then at home, not being so badgering on top of your, uh, of your child, just giving them a little bit of a break. Thank you for that. And I wanted to move to um, Ashley and talk about healthy habits for a second. What are some healthy habits we can help students create? Sure. Um, so I kind of would go back to the basics to start and check in with students to see kind of how their sleeping is going, how they're eating, um, how they're exercising. 
Um, I know teenagers can have some crazy sleep schedules and I don't see how they function on such little sleep. So just checking in with them on those kind of basic things and seeing, you know, are they getting enough of those things um, is a good idea. Um, also, Kayla kind of mentioned how, you know, chaotic this year has been and our schedules have changed. So maybe just having a routine at home, um, you know, some predictability um, would be good just to know kind of what to expect and lessen that anxiety a little bit. Um, some other habits could be practicing relaxation techniques like deep breathing. There are tons of videos on YouTube that help you like time your breath in and out um, for deep breathing. Um, so those are really good. Um, and making sure to make time for things that are fun. You know, we talk about academics and their canvas all day long, but, you know, they should be doing something fun too. Um, talking about that break, like Miss Kathy said. Yeah. Um, I would encourage them to reach out to others. Um, I think teenagers especially really respond when they have close relationships to their parents and teachers. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, they're friends as well, but when they have those adults they can trust, they really will open up. Um, and journaling is also a good idea. I know exactly. I used to do that as a teenager. That can help just get it out. They don't want to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the last thing is paying attention to how much social media or news they're taking in. I know these kids are on their phones 24 seven, walking down the halls. Um, so just being mindful of how much they're taking in and how that might be impacting their anxiety. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I wanted to go um, uh, back to Kathy <laughs> with my next question. What about talking to your child if you're concerned? Um, how do you even open up a conversation, um, a healthy conversation? Well, I think you need to thread kind of lightly. You, you, you know your child better than anyone. So certainly, um, if you're picking up your child after school, the child is a car rider or you're waiting on your child to enter in from school, you can pick up on, you know, their demeanor on, on how, how the day is going, how the day, how their day went. You know, certainly if they're coming in and they're just chipper and they're, they're, they're full of energy, that may be a good time to, you know, in, engage in a dialogue about their day. Uh, but if they're coming in and they're just totally stressed out, you know, their demeanor is down, they're just quiet, they have this certain look on their face, and they just don't want to be bothered, just once again, like a, a piggyback, just allowing them that time. It's okay to, in my opinion, um, to uh, ask your child, hey, how was your day? Then you wait patiently for them to respond. Uh, once again, if they respond back, I had a great day, let me tell you about it, then okay, that opens up that dialogue. If they really do not want to, to share at that point, certainly they're going to let you know, you know, I have a break, not right now, you know, let's, re, you know, revisit it a little bit later, then allow the, the, your child to go to their room or wherever part of their body, uh, I mean, part of the room and just kind of de-escalate. And then when you feel like uh, enough time, you know, checking in, but you feel like enough time has passed by, then you go in and say, hey, I'm just, I'm just kind of cons concerned. I'm just here for you. Um, I want you to be able to come to me with anything. Tell me what's going on. How can I help? Um, and just present it in that fashion, um, being kind of supportive. Um, so. Can I have one more thing to that? Yes. Uh Along those lines with Ms. Kathy, I think it's also good to truly listen to them and validate their yes. feelings. I know exactly. as parents and teachers, we're like quick to want to jump in and fix mm -hmm. whatever issue it is like, oh, say they're having anxiety about a test or something. Oh, well, you shouldn't be worried about that test for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, they're feeling what they feel for a reason and it's real mm -hmm. to them. So just exactly. providing that kind of non-judgmental ear and support for them to say what they're feeling, let it out is also good. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Validating their feelings, uh, you know, given that um, very being attentive to what they're saying, because sometimes we tend to want to dismiss what they're saying, like, oh, you know, that can't be the case. 
Right. But everyone is different and everyone is um, has their own different feelings and emotions. So if they're indicating that they're feeling this way, don't dismiss it, don't avoid it. Just listen to them, hear them out without interrupting, you know, just listen to what they're saying. Sometimes students want, they don't want any feedback. They just want to be heard at the time. So sometimes they just want to come out and just let it out like a balloon, just, you know, and then just put it out there and leave it up, leave it where it's at. So, so very good point that Ashley made that I forgot, validating their feelings uh, needing to be heard. Yeah, and so what I hear you both saying is um, not, not escalating, not badgering, but listening, and sometimes just leaving it at listening, not needing to solve it all. Yes, you don't, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, if I can just chime in one more thing. Uh, sometimes we as parents, I'm a parent, okay. we always think we're right, <laughs> you know. And, you know, certainly teachers as well. We always think we're right because we're the adults. We went to school, these degrees, whatever. We're not always right. We're not, you know. And so we need to really um, be there for our students and our kids. Um, and just listen. Sometimes they just need you to listen without having an opinion back. I think, I think that's great advice. Um, and I, we're going to come around to our, our last question and I'm going to go back up to Kayla. Um, if, if your student is overwhelmed with the workload of school, what are some ways that we as the adults can help alleviate that stress? So I'm going to totally piggyback off of um, Ashley and Kathy when we want to validate feelings before we correct behaviors. Um, if a student is overwhelmed with school, um, we, cannot, we cannot improve the schoolwork until we can improve the feelings of being overwhelmed. So we can't move on to step two until we address step one. So absolutely validating those feelings. Um, if they are feeling overwhelmed, one thing that you can help them do is to um, structure their day out. Uh, maybe it's a specific class or a specific time during the day where they just feel like they have just lost all of their motivation, all of their energy. Um, having, having them kind of develop a timeline of what their workload will look like for that day. Um, having built-in breaks is very important, um, especially breaks where you can get them out of the house. Um, screen time, you know, studies show that screen time reduces serotonin levels. Um, and when our, when our chemical imbalance of serotonin is, is off, then that, that's where those, those feelings of anxiety and depression start to creep in. So if you can get your child off of their screen um, at least 30 minutes a day to have some type of brain break, mm -hmm. um, an emotional well-being break, whatever it may be, um, whether it's just taking a, a drive down a, the street because of safety precautions, you don't wanna go into other buildings, just getting them out of the house um, is really important. We also, um, if a student is feeling overwhelmed, you are probably going to be um, dealing with some, some intense emotions um, and our students are okay to have big emotions. We have big emotions as adults, so our students are able to have them too. Um, it's important to, to move as gracefully as you can through these blow-ups. I know Kathy mentioned that we don't wanna meet our students you know, on the same level that they're on. So if we, if we get into a power struggle with our student, odds are they're probably going to win and nothing is going to be alleviated. Um, students are very resilient when it comes to getting their way, um, as we know, especially with teenagers. So again, I, you know, we want to really focus on what they're feeling in that moment, because um, if we were to put ourselves in their shoes, we have probably all been in really significant emotional times in our life before and when we have had responsibilities that we were supposed to perform we can all probably agree that our performance wasn't that great um, and then finally um, if you as the adult are not taking care of yourself you are not going to be able to show up for your student 
we are so empathic and forgiving of others, but we don't, we don't really give ourselves that same empathy and forgiveness. So if you do blow up, if you do have a bad day, if, if you are just feeling stressed, it is okay. We are all human, but we have to forgive ourselves in those moments. We can't let that linger um, because, you know, our students will just pick up on that too. But it is okay for us to have bad days too. We don't always have to be the perfect adult every day because that's just a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves. Um, so even acknowledging our imperfections, I think, could be reassuring and reaffirming to our students that we don't expect them to be perfect either. Um, so absolutely, you know, one of the best things that you can do to take care of your student is to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And would you say that it's okay to maybe talk about those feelings you might be experiencing as the adult, either um, in, in a school appropriate way as a teacher or as a parent, that it's okay to share when you might be having doubts or you might be feeling overwhelmed? And, and that's- Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think that that just increases the connectivity that you have with your students. Um, and it, it, it kind of validates to them that, oh, I'm not the only person in the world that's really struggling right now. Because everyone, you know, everyone is really good about putting that mask on of having everything put together. You mm -hmm. know, everyone is, you know, we're really good at, at doing that. Um, so I think being vulnerable with your students um, could really increase the relationship and the trust that you have with them. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And being authentic, if I can just add, just being very uh, upfront and authentic. The one thing, the one biggest difference that some of the students, um, um, you know, tend to, I hear a lot is that they're very standoffish in, in pro approaching their teachers because they don't feel like you're going to understand um, they sometimes feel like the teachers, all they're wanting is the work, the assignments. It's due, it's due, why didn't you do it? So getting to know, just to piggyback off, okay, getting to know your, your students, you know, being upfront, you know, talking to them, having that open dialogue with them, what's going on? Because you never know what's going on in their home environment. And, um, and may, maybe they didn't get to the work assignment that was due. Uh, if you can, if you can find it some way to give them a little bit more time to complete the task, the assignments, um, that helps a lot too, uh, as well. So, um, yeah, I like what Kayla was saying. I agree with that. Thank you. Well, we're kind of ending our time here together, and I wanted to leave our viewers with um, just some resources for next steps. We'll have some information provided on our school website, South Point um, website. And then you also have the email address and um, office number to our three um, speakers here today. And we're really thankful for their time and for um, each of you ladies for sharing your expertise and um, your care for our students and families at South Point. And we really wanna urge um, parents that if you, if you feel you have some concerns about your student that you please reach out um, to any one of us here at South Point and, and so that we can support you and we can support our students in, um, in being healthy and establishing healthy habits during this really hard time. And so again, I'd just like to thank you each today for sharing and um, we hope that our parents and families find this resource helpful. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.